Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Photo Joseph. Today here with my friend and colleague, Sean Robinson of Panasonic, who eh, rumors been told that they might have released an interesting camera lately. And so we're going to talk about maybe. it. Maybe, just maybe. Sean, welcome. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you on here. So this, of course, is the Photo Joseph's conversation show. I thought about having Sean on as a kind of a photo moment, more interview style. But you know what? thing is, I have this relationship with Panasonic, as most of you viewers are well aware. And so me doing a classic interview really wouldn't be appropriate because, you know, I got skin in the game here. So really what we decided this is going to be is a literal conversation. Sean and I sitting down as if we were sitting down at a bar together, having a drink and of which one of us does actually have. Excellent. Well done to discuss this unbelievably awesome camera that has just come out. Now, there's uh, there's obviously been a ton of press around the GH5 already. Um, absolutely insane amount of press around the GH5. Congratulations. I know you had a lot to do with that. Oh, yes. And, a lot of fun. And uh, obviously, all the interviewers are hitting on the main talking points, the main features. It, it will go through the main feature bullet list. But for people looking for just the straight up tech details, um, you can find those anywhere. So what I want to do is take this opportunity to really chat about the camera, some of the thought process behind the design and some of the decisions that were made, some of the future looking things that were that are designed into it that we know are already coming and already announced. And also just to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the features that maybe haven't been getting a lot of press that you personally might be excited about. Sound pretty good? Cool. Yeah, sounds great, man. All right. Well, let's start off with just get some of the basics out of the way. So the new camera is... The GH5. The GH5. And here it is. If you haven't seen it yet because you've been living under a rock somehow, there is the GH5. And just first thing right on there. So it's covered in water. Water resistant and freeze proof. That's something I keep seeing bandied about. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the the big uh, improvement body wise from the GH4 is that now it's uh, freeze proof down to ten negative 10 degrees Celsius. That's cool. Um, which is something the GH4 didn't have. Okay. So, do, do you know uh, what it was in the GH4? Or was it just not labeled as freeze proof? Um, it wasn't labeled as freeze proof last time, uh, so I don't think we ever gave a specification on it. Okay. But knowing um, you know some of the other um, team members, you know that shot this thing in, in uh, Antarctica and yeah. Alaska and everywhere, the cameras always survived very well. Right. So yeah, yeah, that's something that I've heard repeatedly about the GH4 was taking it into really less than favorable environments, whether it's extreme hot or extreme cold and how well the camera performed. And so mm. knowing that this one's sealed up even better is uh, just an improvement on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, way beefier than, than the 4 was. So. That's, that's awesome. And that was already pretty solid. So. Yeah, absolutely. So when, you're, when you talk about a, a camera being moisture, water, not waterproof, obviously, but um, What's the technical term for it? It's not waterproof. What do you call it? Splash proof? Um, water resistant, splash proof, um, depends on what its IP rating is. Is there an IP rating? Exactly. But, there is. I wish I knew exactly okay. what it was, but I haven't. That's actually the first time that that's actually come up so far. But. Oh, look at that. See, we're already off to a good start in this interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll play Stump the Sean. That's the game, the name of the game. Okay. So uh, so it has an IP rating. I mean, everything that claims any kind of water resistance has one. You're just not sure what it is. So um, if we can find that out, we can insert it in the show notes later on. Oh. Now, to, to have an IP rating or have any kind of water resistance on a camera, obviously the camera's not the only part. There's the lens as well. So there are lenses that are water resistant and lenses that are not. Mm -hmm correct correct yeah so there's there's a number of lenses uh existing in the lineup that are weather resistant so you've got the 12 to 35 35 to 100 the both of the new 12 to 60s the leica and the non-leica variant oh i didn't realize um, there was such a thing a non-leica oh yeah okay yeah um and then uh like the 42.5 the 12 millimeter basically everything new that we're releasing um, is all going to be weather resistant. Um, oh. And that includes the new refreshes for the 45 to 200 and the 100 to 300 as well. Okay, excellent. That's great. So it's not necessarily that it has to be a Leica badged one for it to be water resistant. It's just in the past, it's been the higher end lenses, but now everything going forward is going to be, uh, be, be made water resistant. Exactly, exactly. That's pretty slick. Okay, cool. So, uh, well, let's talk about the lenses then. So and we're already deviating from the camera, but that's fine because it's all announced at once. So there's the 12 to 35 F2.8, mm -hmm. which is just an absolute workhorse lens. And as you just mentioned, and I only discovered looking at B&H the other day, that there's a Mark II of this lens coming out. Correct. So yeah. what, first of all, what lenses are there Mark IIs coming out of? And what is the difference? 
So uh, at CES, we announced the 12 to 35, 35 to 100, 45 to 200, and 100 to 300 are all getting a Mark II or a, a version two. Okay. What that entails is now that they are freeze proof, splash proof, dust proof, where either they were or weren't in the past uh, iterations. And they're all going to be from ship date dual IS2 compatible. Okay. So uh, the 100 to 345 to 200, if you remember correctly, they were never updated for dual IS, even the version uh, one, because okay. they were some of the original lenses in the lineup. Um, so as of the announcement of those lenses, every lens in the lineup, save for I think one or two of them, uh, will all be dual IS2 compatible. Um, so even the and, older lens are going to older lenses will get a firmware update to be dual IS two. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been some confusion based on some of the interviews that we've given, um, since CES, given how crazy everything was. Um, yeah. but the 12 to 35 and the 35 to 100 version ones will be getting a firmware update at some point this year, uh, for dual IS two. That's fantastic. So is there any, need then for a customer who already owns those lenses, the version one of those lenses, will there be a need for them to upgrade to version two? Um, or benefit, I should say. The, the, the benefits of updating to the newer lenses um, are, it's really going to depend on the environment that you're going into. Okay. So the newer, uh, the newer versions are all going to be, like I said, freeze proof, as right. well as they still have splash proof, dust proof, the kind of standard things that you'd expect in a pro series lens. Um, where the original two aren't going to be freeze proof. The other addition is that the iris design is actually a little bit nicer and newer in the newer lenses. Um, so you're going to get, when you zoom with the lenses, you'll get a smoother variance between the aperture shift. Oh, okay. Um, when you're zooming in any, in any of the lenses that has an aperture change. Um, so it, it's, it's a minor refresh, and while the existing lenses that are on the market right now kind of phase out of availability, this sure. lens will take its place. Um, and the only other change there was a uh, cosmetic change as well. So they're all blacked out now with the matte black and white lettering, where yeah. the old ones have kind of the purplish right. gunmetal look. Right, right. So. Okay, great. So some minor improvements, not the kind of things you – if you own the old gear – it is absolutely still 100% viable and compatible, especially with the firmware okay. update that'll come. Uh, no real feature changes. It's more cosmetic. And then, of course, the freeze-proof ability. So if you are working in those environments, then it might be worth the upgrade. But otherwise, people will be pretty right. happy with the lenses they have. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Super. Very good. And those are, from what I saw in B&H, it looked like they're all coming out around the same time as the GH5. Yeah, yeah. So um, all the lenses announced, including the new 12 to 60, all should be shipping at about the same time as the GH5. Okay, great. So this 12 to 60, so you mentioned that there's a, a non Leica variant to that, or is that the well, wrong lens? So there, there is the Leica, there is the non Leica variant right now. It's the M kit that you find with the G85. Okay. Um, but at Photokina, we also showed the mock-ups of a Leica variant of the 12 to 60, which will be an f 2.8 to f 4, uh, which I have one right here, actually. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was going to pull up a picture, but that's better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, compact, lightweight, still weather-sealed, uh, freeze-proof, things like that. But you're getting the Leica glass, the Leica coloring, things like that that, that you know, you'd kind of expect a, uh, from us mm -hmm. in the Leica uh, series of optics. Um, just made for a much nicer kind of general all-purpose 24 to 120 uh, lens. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Cool. That's nice. That's a nice looking lens. Okay. All right. So let's get back into the the camera itself. So. Yeah. Everything. Everything is that we're seeing in the press. Everybody's so excited about is all the video features. Obviously. This, yeah. You know, incredible 4K 60P, the 100 megabit 422 10 bit to the card. Uh, eventual 400 megabit to the card that's off the hook yep. but i'm seeing very little talking about the still photography side of it so we'll talk video but let's talk about this thing as a still camera because at the end of the day oh yeah it is still a camera <laughs> people oh, seem yes. to be forgetting that it is still a camera so uh what kind of improvements are we seeing in the camera purely for the still photographer forget video entirely yeah. pure still photographer what kind of improvements are we seeing in this over the gh4 so um, probably right off the bat is that it's a 20 megapixel sensor now with the low pass filter removed. So we're continuing the trend that we've seen on the G85. Um, 
So, I mean, you're going to see much sharper, better color, um, just based on the sensor mm -hmm. layout. Um, the readout on the sensor is also much, much faster. So if you're going to shoot an electronic shutter for any reason, um, you know, you're trying to be super quiet, um, you're going to be using 4K photo or 6K photo, um, you're going to see much, much less rolling shutter because the readout's much faster. Okay. Um, in addition, there's also brand new color science with the way this camera um, uh, reproduces color. So your blues are going to look way more natural, more blue, like they're going to look like blue should look. Um, your reds and greens are going to look the way they should look or much, much closer than the GH4 did. Hmm. Um, from stills photographers, one of the things we got, and it was also kind of with the, the video crowd as well, um, the GH4 had a bit of a, a color cast like most cameras do. No camera is ever really perfect on color. They'll typically have some sort of color cast built in. Um, but with the new, the new, um, sampling that the camera does with the Venus engine 10 to determine, um, <clears throat> uh, color and edge detail and sharpness, it's, it's made an overall more robust, um, image out of it. I think would be a good way to put it. Hmm. Um, they've also done things with the way they sample, uh, a, nine times the amount of pixel information to determine, what color each pixel is. So kind of like with the color information we're talking about. Um, because of the way they're doing that, they've also been able to suppress things like overshooting. So if you get a real hard edge on something, with the GH4, you'd take a picture and you'd get some like white haloing around that hard edge. Okay. The GH5 doesn't have that um, because we're sampling a bigger area and we're, we're creating each pixel out of that larger area. Um, even things down to um, something as simple as our auto ISO uh, implementation. Um, we've been hammered hard on uh, on different forums about, uh, I think one of them called it a very prehistoric implementation <laughs> of auto ISO. Um, so we, we've added um, a full auto ISO implementation with minimum shutter speed settings. Great with an auto minimum shutter speed, which is going to base kind of around your focal length, so following the old rules we used to follow. Right. Um, be one as over well the as focal exposure length compensation in auto ISO. Okay. Uh, a whole lot of improvements as far as opera uh, operation in the camera for still shooters as well. Okay. Very good. <laughs> and then focusing is massively improved. Of course, this goes for, fo uh, for still photography and for video, but there's Correct. how many focusing points now? in the camera? So we went up to 225 focus points. Okay. Um, so what that means is, you know, in a contrast based system, you are still using the entire frame to still be able to get your focus information. But by jumping into 225 points um, of individual points uh, of selectable areas means that you can now refine it even more. So if you're using group focusing and you're doing tracking work, you're going to be able to be way more accurate with when you lock a point and you move through an area with that point locked. Um, in addition, it's added a, a more refined DFD system with those new points. Explain DFD. Yeah. So um, DFD is it's it's our focusing system that's based in contrast detection. And it stands so for? It, um, stands for depth from defocus. Okay. So what this does is this is paired with Lumix Glass only. So to get the most out of the system, you should use Lumix Glass, okay. either ours or the Leica Lumix Glass. What, what it does is it takes our um, optical information based on what a lens looks like at out-of-focus area at any given um, aperture, distance, and, and characteristic, and it'll know which direction it has to move focus just based on what the bokeh looks like. So that information combined with contrast detection, and then now in the GH5, it adds vector tracking. It's able to determine once you pick a point and you're locked there, where that, what direction that uh, object is moving through the frame, what path it's going to take, and predicts that kind of uh, arc or that area that it's moving through to be able to speed the focusing up while in, in continuous focus, lock in a point, and minimize that kind of overfocus that you see with contrast typically where it goes just slightly past the point right. and then comes right comes back, back in. Yeah. You'll see that this it's it's almost non-existent in in how how much that overshoot is and it's point to point tracking 
like most contrast detections, point to point is always ridiculously fast. But now the contrast system is almost right in line with how fast you're going to find a point to point acquisition. Um, I think we're rating it at 0 0.05 seconds. So it's right up there with probably the fastest in the industry right now. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And it, okay, so in the past, obviously it's been talked about everywhere. It's no, no secret. Um, focus tracking, continuous focus has been one of the weakest points of mirrorless cameras. It's not just Lumix mm -hmm. cameras. It's just across the board. Mirrorless cameras are traditionally weakest that way. And even on something like a Canon, when you flip the mirror out of the way, it's focusing goes through the floor. It becomes exactly. very, very slow. So clearly not having that mirror in there is a problem, has been a problem historically for really high speed focus. So right. one of the things that we had in the, or I'm sure we still have in the Lumix cameras is that the focus tracker where you would manually define a point to focus on something for it to follow, like a person walking through the scene, put the cursor over their face, lock onto it, and hopefully the camera would lock on and follow them through. Now we know yeah. that it's, it works sometimes and it uh, kept up sometimes. Sometimes it lost it. Sometimes it pulsed in and out of focus. Mm -hmm. Do you even need to do that here? Or is this more of the sense of it's, it sees that something is moving and when you're in continuous focus, it just assumes you want to keep that moving target in focus and goes for it. So, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the joy of the flexibility of the system is that if you, if you still want to use that system, it's going to be even more accurate than it could have been in the past. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that the GH4 had, I, I guess, looking at it now in, in how we judge focusing systems today, um, the difference was GH4 read out information at 240 frames per second. Okay. And that's how it gauged its, its focusing information. The GH5 is reading out information at 480 frames a second. Um, and that's that's um, independent of what the lenses uh, rating is at. So some of the lenses are still 240 frame per second, but it still utilizes the 480 hertz system in the camera. Uh, so whether you're going to use the actual like tracking focus and lock a point on or you're just going to use like group AF or single point, it's all going to do pretty much the same thing. Using the tracking is going to be good where if you want the camera, if you're going to try to hold the camera relatively steady and not necessarily really pan with your subject, mm -hmm. that's where the tracking focus will definitely come in handy as opposed to letting the 225 points pick which point is in focus. Okay. Um, from what we tested at the booth uh, at CES, both systems worked pretty much identical to each other mm. um, because – Typically, the motion item is what the, the tracking system is going to pick up on when it's looking at the motion information. Uh, and then using the actual tracking system is kind of just that added benefit of just saying, I want to make sure nothing else gets in the way of this. Right, right. Um, and by using that system, you actually enable uh, the ability to use some of the other continuous autofocus um, tweaks that mm. we've put in the camera. Okay. So um, one of the things that, that a lot of people haven't really seen is that in continuous focus with the GH5, um, we've added uh, this, this ability to actually custom set your, your uh, focusing system here. Okay. So what that means is kind of like how in some other manufacturers, you can go in and say, well, I want to tune the focusing system for motion coming at me in a constant speed with no real variance or... It's moving sporadically, and I want to make sure that it's tuned to pick more motion over locking a specific point. So it's enabled four different sets in the camera specifically for the purpose of saying, uh, ignore if a tree comes in the middle of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, ignore if a person walks in front of that point that I've locked on. And let you really kind of dig really deep down into the focusing system and set it up how you like to shoot. Um, so for sports photographers, I think it's going to be huge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of sports, you have a, a fairly predictable type of movement. Mm -hmm. Not all sports, obviously, but for many you do. And so, yeah, knowing how to do that. So I can imagine something like um, tracking a race car or race horse, something that's moving parallel to the frame. But then there's going to be those lamp posts, those other things that come in between it. You yeah. don't want it to suddenly focus on that. Just stay on the car, the horse, whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Um there was a little bit of this on the G85. It was the first one that kind of allowed you to tweak the focusing a little bit. Mm. But this this has dug right down into the actual sensitivity of the focusing. 
the switching sensitivity, which is how quick it recognizes something else you want to change into focus. Okay. And then also the um, responsiveness of the uh, object prediction for the motion. So uh, it, there's been a ton of refinements mm. uh, for photographers. And then when you're shooting in video, it's the same thing. You have sure. this control. Okay. Neat. <laughs> and speaking of focus too, there is a new, and bring up the picture on here, um, there's a new button on here, this new focus uh, little knob there. So that yep. allows us to position the focusing area, the focus point, wherever we like on this, on the, uh, in the scene without having to really change modes. It's just a dedicated rocker to go in and move that thing around. Correct. Yeah. So like if we look on the back here, it's a little tough to see, but, um, the, the toggle on the back here does allow you to move different directions, change things up. Yeah. Um, as well as like, you know, you can still use touch AF, um, but with going to 225 points now, some of those points, uh, you know, when your thumb's touching it, you may not pick the exact one you want. Mm. So having the toggle now is, is also just a good way to refine that point you want. Um, one of the cool things actually that, that di ha really hasn't been talked about is if I'm shooting the camera and then I want to go vertical with the grip, sometimes that point that you picked when you're horizontal maybe was up. Okay. But then when you turn this way, you still want it to be on the upside. Okay. You can toggle it where when you press the button in, it'll reorient to the same area oh, relative cool. to the way you've turned vertically. How cool. So That's tiny, really neat. Tiny, tiny little things that, that the engineers thought about it, in the feedback from photographers. It always is. Those tiny little things that make such a, such a big difference in the whole experience. That's fantastic. Do you have the grip on that one? I didn't see when you picked it up. I don't, unfortunately. Okay. okay, let's just bring up a picture then. Since you mentioned the grip, there's the camera with the grip on it. So um, one of the questions that I had that I haven't seen anywhere is the battery configuration. So looking mm -hmm. at the video, I don't know if you watched my video that was the kind of analysis of your video. <laughs> it's very geeky. I had to do something. <laughs> I had to do something on the day of launch. Yeah, right. There's an animation that shows the grip going onto the camera. And I could see, mm -hmm. okay, the camera battery door is closed. So I'm assuming yep. there's a battery in there. Correct. And then in the grip, does it holding one or two additional batteries? Just one. One. Okay. Okay. So, so two um, it's the same as a GH4 design wise. So it's one battery in camera, one battery in the camera. It's uh, in the grip. Okay. Um, with the GH5, uh, I think the rating now is 410 shots per charge uh, through through the the rating system. But the GH5 has also added the new uh, LVF. Um, uh, mode that the G85 had. So you can prioritize shooting through the, the viewfinder and exponentially expand your battery life based on it. So uh, I, I think the GH4 was rated at maybe like 500 or 490 shots. So with all the technology that's been pumped into the camera, um, it's only a minor drop in battery performance. Mm. Um, so mo most people, I think, are still going to be incredibly uh, pleased with how well the battery performs. Okay. If you go – this is a question. I've never even – never put any real thought into this. But if you go into electronic shutter mode, I would assume the battery lasts longer because it doesn't have to physically move parts around? Uh, I think it should last longer. But honestly, I think the difference in battery performance is going to probably be negligible in okay. the end. Um, because you're still working the screen, you're still working the viewfinder. Um, the actual power to actuate the shutter, I think, is 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 a, a marginal mm. um, draw. Um, it's really but that, I mean, that LCD. If you can turn that off, go through the the eye cup mostly, then you're going to be saving. That's where you're going to get your yeah. most savings. Yeah, and even at that, I mean, you know, we we look at the um, this, is, this is perfect segue into the rest of the camera too. The um, the the rear LCD has also gotten a bump too. So we went from three inch to three point two inch. Okay. Um, it's a one point six K dot screen, and it's actually now an RGBW screen. What is RGBW? <laughs> you heard of that? Means so uh, basically what it means is that for every pixel, there's also a white pixel now. Okay. So what it, what it means is that the screen is going to be much brighter, but also out in broad daylight, you're going to be able to see the screen and actually determine information on it in direct sunlight, much, much better than a regular RGB, uh, rear LCD or an OLED. Okay. Um, so it, it's making, if, if you're shooting, utilizing primarily the rear screen, 
it makes the experience that much better um, for people shooting that style. So if you're shooting video outdoors in full sun, you can still see what's on that panel. Whereas today it's just largely gets blacked out. You can't see anything. Correct. Correct. Um, and then in addition to it, you know, we've also beefed up the EVF. Um, that's now a 3.8 million dot, uh, display. It's OLED and it has a 0.76 magnification. So it is gigantic. It is bright and it is amazingly color accurate. Nice. Oh, that's fun. I can't wait to look at it. Is it we're just putting that the GH5 up to your eye versus the GH4? It's just a night and day difference. Yeah, yeah. You you can definitely tell the, the two and a half, three year uh, development difference yeah. in viewfinders. That's cool. Um, I think honestly, even this EVF even even is a, a step above the GX8 EVF, which is still what regarded as one of the better uh, micro four thirds EVFs. Mm. Yeah, it's that's a big that's a big view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Okay. So bigger LCD, bigger EVF, got the focus controls on there. I'm, I'm looking at the back of it here, looking for other buttons to, oh, yeah. to jump onto before we change to another position <laughs> of the camera. Um, when you're in the vertical with the vertical grip, I guess it's funny. I never even, I never used one on the GH4. I think I may have not realized or completely forgotten that there was one for the GH4 <laughs> that you mentioned, but, uh, so you've got the controls on there. So in vertical orient, obviously, in addition to the battery, when you're shooting vertical, you've got your your shutter release. You have a control dial. Is there probably two control dials? Um, yep. I yep. Two control dials, yep. one in the front and back. Yep. Thumb and then the finger and then that focus control. So that that's going to be the new thing on there is that focus controller. Yeah. Yeah. And on the vertical grip, you still carry your white balance, your ISO and your exposure compensation as well up okay. on the actual top of it. Oh, okay. So it, it still Same. carries just like most other, um, you know, higher end grips that, that you're going to find from other manufacturers. It's it's designed to be mimicking as much as it can the actual top controls of the camera. Oh, OK, great. Handy. Yeah, it's, I like shooting vertical like that. It's a it's a nice way to go. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, let's flip this thing around. We're, we're definitely jumping around all over the place. But this is an illustration that you sent me today that I have not seen before. And yes. this shows the HDMI lock on there. Correct. So we're stepping away from still photography now for a moment, but the HDMI lock, I mean, this is, let's see, that in combination with, where is that? I'm sure I saw one in here. The full size, didn't I see one? I thought you sent me one. Top left. Top. There we go. There you go. There we go. Full size HDMI port. Oh my God. That's. That's oh, yes. huge. So you've got full size HDMI and that locking thing. So the locking thing comes in the box, right? Yep. It's not an yep. extra purchase. Box. This is something that snaps onto the camera to hold that HDMI port in there and not let go. Yeah. So it, it actually screws into it as well. Oh, wow. So okay. what you'll see on the side of the camera, since the ones you have are renderings, um, what you'll see here is the two little uh, kind of silvery mm -hmm. points here. Those are both um, threads. Okay. So the piece will actually drop in here, screw in, and then okay. what it does is it allows you to actually run the HDMI cable through. So it's that dark hole under the plus one. Exactly. There, that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Got it. So on the flip side, it, it's going to allow you to um, run the HDMI cable through, loop it in so that you know it's secure, as well as there's space to run the headphones through it or the um, USB-C. Uh, cable through it as well. Okay, very good. Yeah, that that's incredible because that is one of those things I've, as I'm sure anyone out there who's ever shot video, has destroyed many, many an HDMI cable because that little micro USB thing is just, or micro HDMI is just fragile, yes. so fragile. This is a nice, heavy, robust port, so thank you for that. That is incredible. Okay, you mentioned USB-C. When I first did the yes. video, I said, I don't really understand the point of the USB-C because no one's going to transfer files off of their camera through the USB port. Um, and then someone pointed out, yeah, unless you've got a new MacBook Pro <laughs> that only has USB-C. And I went, oh, yeah, interesting. I was I was going to say something, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's, what's actually funny about that is so, <clears throat> you know, t typically a lot of times, you know, it's it's kind of encouraged to take the the cards out of the camera, put them in a reader, and then and then move on that way. Mm -hmm. But really, looking at in general, both PC and Mac, a lot of them are moving away from putting SD cards in there. 
or they're switching to micro SD because they're trying, you know, it's the race for the thinnest device yeah. you can make. Insane. Well, yeah. So with the GH5, they added USB-C type 3.1, uh, which means it can transfer th uh, the theoretical up to, I think, 5 gigahertz is the, um, or gigabit is the transfer Jesus. speed on it. Okay. So that means that in actual some cases, plugging this camera directly into your MacBook Pro will actually be faster than if you take the card out and put it into an SD card reader. Right. So for some people, it's going to be much, much better. Right. Uh, and then obviously there's I mean, five gigabit. That's beyond the read and write speed of the SD cards at this point, correct. isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. there's room to grow in there. Yeah, for now. Exactly. So there's room to grow in there where you, like you said, if this may be faster than your reader, and that would have to be a pretty robust reader. There's not too many USB-C. I'm sure there are USB-C readers out there, plenty of them, but... Uh, yeah, but um, knowing that you have just one USB-C cable to connect and get them get at those incredible speeds and that you can access both cards. So what happens? Correct. You plug it in. Do you just see if you have two cards in the camera, you see them mount as two different cards mount on your desktop? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. The first one will come up as the DCIM Lumix and then the other one comes up as a secondary uh, device drive, at least on PC. I haven't tested it on how Mac comes up. Sure. Okay. Well, where where this is kind of future thinking is that so the GH5 is also one of the first cameras that's actually going to utilize the um, uh, SD V60 and V90 class cards, which are minimum um, uh, minimum tra uh, minimum write speed of uh, 60 meg and 30 meg. I believe okay. I could be slightly wrong on those numbers, but. Um, for the firmware that's coming out in the second half of the year where we're going to enable 400 megabit all intro recording, you're going to have to utilize a V, I think it's at least a V60 card, um, which we did announce V90 cards at, the, at uh, CES as well. Hmm. So when you start looking at things like that, I mean, you know, a, a, a 128 gig card at 400 megabit all intra, you know, you're talking like 15 minutes of record limit sure. uh, of time on a single card. So having, in this case, having the USB that can actually output really, really fast where most card readers for the moment don't enable you that transfer speed is going to be beneficial for those cases where you really need to offload content quick. And since the SD cards are hot swappable, you know, that means while you're recording, you can then take one out, drop the other one in and, and keep your relay recording going. Okay. Um, you, you'll be able to actually, you know, if you have a second GH, you'll be able to constantly have the content loading off and loading off and loading off mm -hmm. while you're still sitting there ready to shoot. Uh, yeah. Okay. Does the, can USB-C be used for anything else like, uh, tethered shooting, a way to transfer files to the computer directly upon shooting, um, or anything other than mounting the mounting of his SD card. So as of right now, there's no tethered shooting until the firmware released in the end of the year oh. uh, or second half of the year. Um, that second half firmware will release USB tethering. Um, I don't have too many specifications or details on it yet. Okay. Um, but as soon as we actually get the information from Japan as to how it's going to work, what it's going to work with, um, we'll definitely, um, you know, keep, keep you involved. And by that point, I mean, you'll be shooting the camera, so yeah, sure. this will be perfect. No, that's great. That, that is one of those, um, unfortunately, I don't know if this is a Lumix thing or if it's a mirrorless thing or where it falls down, but the w tethered shooting has not been something that we have. You know, you plug in your Canon Nikon, whatever, into um, in your computer in Lightroom, capture one, they see it immediately, and you have instant tethered shooting. Mm -hmm. I know there is a third-party software solution, but it's not the fastest, most reliable thing in the world. So whatever it is that they're doing, hopefully it is going to um, bring it in line with everything else in the industry. That would be that would be very nice. And I know you don't know, and we don't know what it will or won't do, but that would be very welcome. You can pass that along to them. <laughs> it's a I, I, I can say there's there's a lot of us that have been championing 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 that's the word I think that's right um, wanting to make it more streamlined yeah. um, for the professional photographers and uh, you know with with as far as the GH five has been advanced from the four and the rest of the series um, I think whatever comes out um, stills photographers both studio and non studio photographers are going to be quite surprised and and feel very at home shooting with the system now. That's great. Yeah, that would be that would be impressive to have a USB-C, which is a very 
it's a nice robust cable like the HDMI full size. It's a good oh, yeah. solid feeling cable to get a long cable like that, plug it in one end of your computer, one end of the camera, and that's it. And have that really reliable, solid connection to shoot tether. That would be a, that'd be a glorious thing. So excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear yeah. this progress. I didn't know that there was anything even happening. It obviously it may mm-hmm. still be some time out, but at least we know that it's being worked on and um, it's something that'll be in this camera in the GH5. Oh yeah. And, and that's, that, that was one of the things that we wanted to make certain from day one of launch. Um, great. You know, it's it's kind of not common for camera companies to announce a firmware roadmap. Um, yeah, no, absolutely isn't. Yeah, it's huge. I think um, one of the one of the sites that I was reading on compared it very much to Tesla and 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 their updating roadmaps for oh, yeah. the cars, um, which you know, hey, <laughs> ironically, kind of sonic, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, you know, I, with with the fact that you know uh, April, so very shortly after the camera starts actually being available and on shelves. There'll be a firmware in April, which is going to add 4.2.2 10-bit in full HD. Um, and then second half, you know, we're adding things like the 400 megabit all intra in 4K, the 200 megabit all intra in 1080, um, high-resolution anamorphic, USB tethering, and then we're also adding what's called hybrid log gamma right. um, as a shooting uh, uh, color space. You know, it, it, it speaks to how... Panasonic envisions the GH series of cameras living for a very long period of time. I mean, if you look in the history of the Lumix cameras, I don't think any other camera has been updated as regularly and as often as the GH cameras have sure. in the last two years. Um, and I, I think that that trend is going to continue. That's great. It really is. It, it is one of those incredible things that when I first got involved with the Lumix cameras, seeing how they did get those progressive updates and being used to sitting on a camera that once you bought it, that was it. They were, the only reason they would ever update something is if there was a severe bug that was found. And even then yeah. they were more likely to say, well, you should just buy a new camera. So this is uh, on behalf of photographers everywhere. I thank you. This is uh, this is great. Very, very cool. OK, uh, you mentioned the extra high resolution anamorphics, the 6K mm-hmm. anamorphic, which has been bandied about a bit. Let's okay. Let's actually explain anamorphic to begin with, in case any of the viewers are not familiar. Because anamorphic shooting is not exactly the most common thing in the world. So now we're in the space of video. Uh, <clears throat> what is and explain the basics of anamorphic? Forget about the resolution. We don't care about yeah. 4K, 6K, whatever. Just what is anamorphic shooting, and then let's take it from there. Okay, so so there's a couple different um, types of anamorphic shooting. So you have um, we'll 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 go with the most common that most people are probably used to seeing, and they don't realize they see it. Um, major motion pictures, uh, uh, JJ Abrams is a good example. Um, one of the biggest characteristics that you see with anamorphic is you see that kind of major horizontal lens flare in a, in a, in a, in a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a characteristic of anamorphic, whether it's added in post or it's shot that way. Now, how do you get that? So what anamorphic is, is if you, if you think of optics in general, um, Typical SLR or camera lenses are circular. So what that means is I, you know, I have the 85 here. You see that the aperture diaphragm is circular. Now with an anamorphic optic, it's not circular. It's elliptical. So what you get out of that is you get a very particular looking bokeh. Um, it looks like a cat's eye in the background. But what that does, or, or what that basically means, is that if you're going to record proper 2x anamorphic, so 2x, what that means is that the image is actually going to have to be recorded in a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. Okay. So the lens is capturing the information and it's squishing it two times. So you end up with a bunch of really tall, skinny people in your, your frame. And the purpose of this is to take a set of... Um, a set uh, uh, focal length, but then increase that lens's um, field of view and compression in the background. So if you take a 70 millimeter lens, you're going to get a wider field of view, but you're going to get the compression of a 140 millimeter lens. So when you set up two people in a shot, which you can do with a 70 millimeter lens, you get the compression effect, so the background's way closer onto your subject, like 140 millimeter, mm-hmm. but you get your field of view of 70 millimeter. 
So this is pretty typical in, in major motion pictures. If you look at any, any movie, you watch it on your, your home TV and you get the black bars on the top and bottom, usually it's in what's called a 2, 3, 9 to 1 aspect ratio. Mm-hmm. So that's CinemaScope. Um, the GH4 was the first camera sub, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. You know, we're talking in the RE series cameras okay. to enable you to shoot anamorphic um, or what's also kind of referred to as uh, open gate. Um, the GH5 is now going to allow you to take the full sensor and record 4K anamorphic without the width crop that the GH um that the GH4 had because it was doing pixel to pixel. Since the GH5 reads full width of the sensor, you're going to keep your your field of view at whatever optic you put on it, um, but allow you to still record the full vertical and horizontal resolution in 4K. Um, it's kind of a baseline explanation of it. Um, okay. I can go super technical with no, it. No, no, that's I'll fine. A lot of people. That's fine. The at the end of the day, what what anamorphic is doing is is recording a wider field of view by squishing the view optically, not and that's a really important part of it. It's an optical distortion. It squishes exactly. the 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 uh, scene into a frame, and then in software in the computer, you stretch it back out to make things right. look normal. And the end result is a wider frame, mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily adding pixels because your pictures you're not adding pixels. You're making your pixels rectangular instead of square. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you're not actually adding pixels to it, but the effective result is a larger image than you would get if you were just shooting standard square pixel um, with a standard right. standard round lens. Yeah. So you get more. Yeah. So is, now is this where the 6K part of it comes in when you're shooting 4K and now when you stretch it out, it has the appearance of 6K or is that something else? So, so that's, that's a little bit different. So from day one with the camera, you're getting the 4k anamorphic, which is something that the GH4 had. Um, you get that in 24, uh, 30 frame. And then if you're in the cinema mode, you get the cine 24 frame with the firmware release in the second half of the year, you're going to get what we're calling high resolution anamorphic. Um, now it's been a little confused that it's 6k anamorphic, but for some Ease of understanding, um, we're calling it high resolution anamorphic because in the cinema world, typically when you mention 6K, you're meaning 6,000 pixels along the horizontal resolution, okay. which the camera is not doing. Okay. <clears throat> the width of the pic- the width of the sensor is around 5,100 pixels. Okay. So we're we're not claiming that it's 6K video. Okay. Um, but basically, instead of recording the way it does now, where it takes this the 5.1K image and then downsamples to 4K while using the full sensor, this will allow you to do a pixel-to-pixel full sensor readout in 4x3 with no uh, downscale. Okay. So that's that's where we get that it's a higher resolution anamorphic recording. So the file that comes off of the camera will be larger than 4K. It'll have more Correct. pixels than 4K. It'll effectively be the same thing as if you had put it into still photo mode and fired off 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second. You will have Correct. that full resolution, but packaged up in a video file. Exactly. That's kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, That's you know, great. what what that basically affords people is, you know, these these modes aren't just for anamorphic. Um, when we start talking about shooting at this high resolution capability, it allows you to shoot in what um, typical cinematographers used to call open gate. So that means you're always recording a four by three aspect ratio with circular optic for the purpose of taking your 16 by nine frame for 4K and moving it up and down through that area. So if you're tracking a, uh, a stunt coordination and it's a car jumping through the frame, but you notice that the car actually jumps out of your safety area in the 16 by nine and it's actually above it. Well, that means that you've actually still recorded all that information in post. You just drag your frame up to track that information and then drag it back down to come through. So, um, old school filmmakers, you know, called this open gate okay. um, because they would just take the mask out of the uh, the recording. So in this case, you're just being able to do it that way as well. Okay, very good. So that also then would allow 
one of the main reasons that I'll shoot 4K, most of my client delivery is still HD, but I'll shoot 4K for something like an interview. Say I'm doing a shot right here, you know, me on camera talking because I can punch into the frame and not have to scale up, right? So mm -hmm. I can, starting with 4K, I can, um, if I'm running out HD, I just cut the thing down to 50% and now I'm in HD. But if I want to uh, punch in a little bit, a punch in 200%, basically I've got that without actually scaling up. So now I will have the ability because I'll have more than 4K pixels wide. You said it's about 5,000 pixels wide? Yeah, it's like 5,100 wide. Okay, so basically almost an extra thousand, actually it would be a little bit more. If it's 5,100, a little bit more because it's 4096. So about a, so a thousand pixels, call it that, extra on the sides, 500 in each side, so I can pan and scan or push in. So I now have the ability to push in, not a whole lot, but I can still push in a little bit and mm -hmm. deliver 4K without actually scaling up. Exactly, yeah. That's kind of insane. Yeah, just just a little bit. And and you don't have to be shooting anamorphic for that. You can just nope. shoot high, yeah. yeah. Exactly, since, since the optics for four thirds are designed to cover the four third sensor, right. it, it's, it's allowing you to shoot in a true open gate method that they used to shoot in. Oh, that is um, so cool. And then, you know, add on top of it the fact that it's a fully stabilized system for this kind of shooting because the GH5 added five axis um, stabilization that we've seen in a number of the rest of the Lumix cameras means that should you want to shoot anamorphic, you have, I think, the only optic or only sensor stabilized anamorphic camera on the market. And then on top of it, you can actually dual IS if you're using our lenses. So. Doesn't really get much better than that. <laughs> if someone wants to shoot anamorphic, they're not shooting with a, a Lumix lens. They are shooting with a third-party lens to give them that anamorphic distortion, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's – I know we, we, we played with this, some of this stuff, and we've met up um, over the years. And there yeah. are lenses that are dedicated. It's a single lens that you put on the camera that does the anamorphic. And then there are – I don't know if adapter is really the right word, but an additional lens yeah. you put on top of your existing lens that allows you to do that. And it's a, a bit of a poor man's way to do it, right? It's considerably less expensive than the dedicated lenses. Considerably less. I mean, you know, you're, you're looking at um, for a set of uh, SLR magic anamorphics, um, you know, you're talking maybe like, I think it's like $8,500 for a set of three. If you look at Cook, who makes, I mean, anyone that knows anything about anamorphic optics, you'll immediately recognize Cook. You know, you're talking, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a lens from them, okay? Uh, because they're vintage. Oh. But <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it it's gotten to where because of what we've been able to do with the camera, and because of this resurgence in the anamorphic look, you're seeing companies like SLR Magic and some others um, that that are making optics for this kind of system, and they are they're way more priced into where people can actually afford them. You don't have to go out and rent these things. Um, they're in the four thirds mount, so they're they're native right. to the system. And the optics are, are awesome quality. I mean, that's that's what we had on display at, uh, at CES. We had one of the SLR Magics on display. And with an external monitor to show you the D squeeze mm -hmm. and to show you if you're shooting in log, to show you the, the um, uh, preview with a LUT added, it, it really is kind of that wow factor if you're looking to step up your footage and you can actually take time and shoot with um, anamorphic. That's really cool. That's really cool. I had something we, I was going to play with a while ago and, and we just never got around to it. So hopefully, get, give me hands of some of these guys and give them a go. Well, now I got to wait for the GH5 because exactly. there's no point in playing with the GH4 anymore on this. So. <laughs> we'll wait, we'll wait oh, no, 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 no. GH4 is still going to make a solid backup camera. This, to the no, GH5. that is absolutely true. It is. And I've had people <laughs> ask me, uh, you know, oh, I just ordered a GH4. Should I return it? Or uh, I've got a couple GH4s. Are they, is there any point in having it? It's like, oh, hell yeah. It's still a fantastic camera. And yeah, just because oh, the yeah. GH5 came out doesn't mean the GH4 no longer works. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful B camera. <laughs> Wonderful B camera. And, you know, eventually if you can, well, fortunately at these prices, you know, it's, if you're in the, doing this for a living, these prices aren't that aren't bad at all. So you can really can't afford to replace your camera gear. Um, yeah. And it's not going to break the bank. So that's very cool. Okay. Uh, so, so that's anamorphic. You talked about the, the LUTs. Um, let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a moment. So as it is today with the GH4, if you're shooting in V log, what you're looking at on the camera is that very flat, very, 
hard to really gauge what you're mm -hmm. looking at image. You have to apply the LUT, the lookup table, to give it a look. But you can't do that in camera on the GH4. So Correct. On yeah, the, GH5, the, the GH4 though, was a very basic setup for sure. it. Sure. You could, if you hooked up a, a separate recorder, like an Atomos Ninja Assassin or Shogun, then you could load a LUT into that and view it there. But on the camera, mm -hmm. on the LCD, you couldn't. But now that's changed in the GH5. Is that right? Or am I mis misremembering? Okay, it has. All right. Yeah. So with the GH5, um, one of the things that, that we should clarify right out of the gate okay. is um, V-Log L is still a paid uh, unlock. Sure. Um, but what you get when you when you pay to unlock it is obviously, okay, you, you get the ability to shoot in log. But we've also added the um, a LUT preview assist. So you can load up to four different... Um, LUTs into the camera for, you know, previewing Rec. 709 or, or whatever else. Um, this allows you so that um, when you're using your focus assists, when you're using focus peaking, typically a log profile makes it very hard to use those things because they're looking for hard edges and things to find focus on. Well, when you flatten contrast out, it's kind of hard to, for a focus assist to tell what you're actually focused on. Okay. By applying the LUT in the camera... For preview, it allows you to focus like you normally would. If you're viewing to an external monitor, say for a client, to be able to see the footage while you're shooting, they can actually see a rough grade of you know what it's going to kind of come out to look at, and you know they're not seeing this super flat gray image and then asking you, well, why why does it look like that? What am I paying you for? That kind of <laughs> that kind of avoids that whole conversation. Um, and what it allows you to do also in the GH5 is it also allows you to output that LUT preview to a monitor. So if you're using just a dummy monitor that doesn't have the ability to load LUTs in or anything like that, you'll still be able to preview this, this image with the LUT applied on an external monitor or on a TV or whatever your, your external device is for viewing um, and then really kind of work with it. Okay. Um, and then in, in addition with with the LUT and with the, the V-Log system, since we're on this kind of topic, um, they've also added waveform monitoring and they've added a vector scope to the camera. So, you know, if, if you're someone who's shooting with log and you're shooting, you know, the, this level of, of video, you probably know what waveforms are. You probably know what a vector scope is and you realize how useful these tools are. And if you don't happen to have an external monitor that has these tools for you, the GH5 now has them built in as well. That's great. That is very useful. That's I know that's something we had talked about before. Because I typically when I'm shooting with the GH4, I'm shooting with the Ninja Assassin attached to it because I like, you know, for one, the big screen obviously makes it way easier to see your shot, compose your shot, focus your shot. All very important. But then it also had the waveforms on there so that I could monitor my exposure. And for me, the way I like to shoot video is I don't want to change aperture or certainly shutter speed while I'm in the middle of a shot. But as you, as lighting changes, you go from a darker room to a lighter room, whatever, you need to change exposure. I'll have a variable ND on the front of the lens. And I'm just rocking that variable yeah. ND back and forth to allow more or less light in to change the exposure. But if you don't have the waves on there, then you have no way of knowing, really knowing where your exposure is. And so, yeah, yeah having that is, is insanely useful. And I'll, I will still continue to shoot largely with an external monitor and recording straight to ProRes just because I like shooting that way. But to know that I can I can do it just on the camera without any of the external is huge. Yeah. Oh look at that. Oh yeah. And yeah. and so I mean like you know you see it's it's just like everything else. You know, we've we've enabled you to to actually see the thing in there. It it's very, very responsive when you're looking at what it can give you. So yeah. it's 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 definitely I think one of the cooler features that, that that the engineers added to it, and I think we took a lot of people by surprise when we when we mentioned that. Yeah. Um, I know in 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 the one interview I gave at a CS after the press conference, everybody around me as soon as I showed that it was kind of like a shock and awe moment. <laughs> so, super. <laughs> kudos to the engineers in Japan that 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 worked tires tirelessly to make this camera a reality. Excellent. Well, we all. Thank them. All right, uh, let's go. Let's have a shot about this accessory here. This is the replacement for what was affectionately called the YAG, the external yep. device that gave us uh, all the extra inputs and outputs. And this, unfortunately, I only have this one view. I don't have a, I don't think I have a side view of this, do I? 
No, it's the one. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the other views don't have anything else on them. Okay. So, so I sent that one. <laughs> so that guy, um, that let me bring it back up one more time. So this guy attaches to the hot shoe of the camera, Correct. gives us a significant amount of audio control, and of course has two audio inputs, XLR inputs. Correct. Correct. So yeah. what, what does this allow a filmmaker to do? All right. So the, um, the, the XLR adapter on the GH5, um, to start with, users of the system are going to be probably very happy because it's not more than the camera like the <laughs> YAGH was. Um, uh, right. The, the XLR adapter is going to sell for three ninety nine. Right. And doesn't require a, um, a, a, a generator power. truck. Yeah, a generator <laughs> truck to follow you around to power the thing. Right. Yeah. You know. We, we, we kind of learned after um, the YAGH came out um, and how quickly HDMI recorders were adapted. So this this piece for the GH5, what it, what it gives you is obviously, okay, you get two XLR in, you get phantom power, you get a lot of the, the kind of more solid uh, audio recording capabilities that you would typically end up using with something like a Zoom H5n or something like that. But what it gives you... I think that not a ton of people have picked up on, some have, is that when you're shooting an MOV and you're shooting 4K or 1080 for that matter, is that it's going to give you 96 kilohertz at 24-bit audio. So you will be getting true high-resolution audio with a 399 adapter that connects into the hot shoe. Um, now it's powered through the hot shoe and the audio is transferred through the hot shoe. So... One of the first questions that we saw online about this is, well, is it compatible with the GH4? Uh. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, it's only compatible with the GH5, uh, and your headphone monitoring is still through the camera. Okay. Um, so some people had, had expressed some um, concern or complaint or issue with it. Um, but, yeah, your headphone monitoring is still through the camera. Okay. Well, I don't see why that's a problem. Why would eh. people... Yeah, I'm sure there's so, a good reason that people don't want that, but okay. Yeah, um, and actually, that that that's one of the points that I did want to make about it when we were talking. So, a lot of people expressed issue with the headphone jack on the GH4 because it blocked this right. motion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So on the GH5, the headphone jack is moved up very slightly, so it still has some interference with the headphone jack. But it's not at the same level that the GH4 had. Okay. Um, and the GH4, in some cases, it you know if you're tilting your screen the right way, it would pretty much completely block out the rear screen. Right. Because it was shifted up slightly in with this guy, the only area that say a set of um, you know Apple earpods or uh, or earphones, whatever they're called, um, or even like my my basic uh, OnePlus headphones. The only area that they overlap on the rear screen is actually now in the blacked out safety area and in the actual frame of the, okay. the finder. So it's a little improvement. I know for a lot of people it's not perfect. A lot of people are probably going to harp on it because it's not 100% perfect. Uh, but for those those that have mentioned some concern with it or issue, I, I would say definitely um, go in and try it. Um, this is a little bit of a shameless plug. We are going around uh, a bunch of our dealers throughout January, bringing mm. the cameras into stores so oh, that nice. customers can see them. Nice. Um, so definitely take a look at it, see it. You know, it, it, there are some minor improvements. Is it perfect? Nah, maybe yeah. not perfect for the way you want to shoot, but it's definitely a heck of a lot better. I would imagine some entrepreneurial young spirit could make a headphone jack just a tiny little adapter a tiny little dongle that is extremely low profile that would plug into there and get the plug completely out of the way sounds like a new business proposition for you joseph yeah, believe me, i got enough businesses as it is um but that seems like i mean that would not be hard to do it's just wires there's nothing in the world that says you exactly. have to have that huge plastic hunk of plastic sticking out of there and that's what gets in the way it's not the port itself it's what's sticking out of the port exactly. so you put something super low profile in there that'd probably work okay all right Whoever so does, it'll be a millionaire <laughs> it ain't gonna be me i don't have time for this crap okay so uh <laughs> okay so with this um 
audio. What, what is it called? The auto adapter? What's the official name? So it's the DMW XLR one. Yeah, we 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 have a great time at naming the, things the, easy. The dumbwa, the dumb dumbwa, the dumb. Like, at least the other one we could call the yag. <laughs> The dumbwa. Okay, so with the dumbwa, at least it's better than so this. is not DMY. Then we'd have to call it the dummy, and that'd be bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you get your 96k dual XLR input. So on it, from a totally practical sense, one of the real, real world scenario situations here, set, setups here, would be an interview with two wireless labs. So you could take two wireless mics, plug into this thing, have it all on a very small rig or have the wireless packs in your pocket, whatever, but have two wireless labs and recording straight into the camera and recording that audio on two separate channels. Exactly. Right. And that's exactly. the key. That is now, the key. Now, you also need to mention too, that you have to be recording an MOV for the 96 kilohertz, 24 bit audio. Okay. So for most people, that's not going to be a problem, but yeah, you know, why, it's just something to be aware of. So. Why, why, I mean, what, what else? Why would you be? Why wouldn't you record an MOV? Some people like to record MP4. You know, hey. but I mean, MOV is an MP4. It's an H H.264 MPEG file and an MOV wrapper. Yeah. It, so where where it comes into play is is you know it's the Mac users versus the PC users again. You know, I think um, and correct me if I'm wrong. This is the one that I always screw up. One of them can be edited on both platforms. One can only be edited on uh, PC. Um, so in some cases that's, that's where some users may have issues. And in a case like that, that means that then you have to convert it to the other to be able to be edited. But if you're using premiere, it's not going to be a problem. Okay. If you're using final cut, that's where it may come into a problem depending on which one you're shooting. And I think MOV is the safe one. Yeah, no, that, that wouldn't be the case because final cut, you can throw anything at it and edit. No problem. Okay. So, so um, yeah, if, it, if we, anything, MOV might be, I think MOV is still a QuickTime format. That's a, probably a proprietary QuickTime wrapper. So there's probably a licensing yeah. fee paid to QuickTime, to Apple for QuickTime MOV that is not happening on certain Windows platforms or certain Windows um, yeah. apps. Who knows? Okay. In, All right. Well, in, any, in reality, everything's gotten so cross-platform, yeah. honestly, between Windows 10 and Mac OS, I, I, I think users in both realms are going to be very capable to do everything yeah. that they want with any camera they want. So. Yeah. And I, someone will correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but like you said, Premiere, Premiere can edit everything. It's like Final Cut. You can throw anything at it and you can edit it. And if it's exactly. a platform thing, I'd be very surprised because everybody these days is cutting in either Premiere or Final Cut. Uh, those are the two really big ones. There's, um, you know, Blackmagic's um, uh, Da Vinci is is gaining popularity, and all of those can just edit anything you throw at it. So yeah, yeah, that's that's not an issue. So okay, so just for those who want to know, you got to shoot an MOV to get the 96k. But I mean, Derdoy, just do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. That that no, that's really really cool because that is one of those things. If I want to shoot two wireless labs right now, I have to have a, a big external device, and I have to record to that external device. I can't record into my camera and keep my left and right on separate channels. At least if you can, I haven't figured out exactly how to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I might be just be doing something wrong, but I just did a big thing where I had to have it all externally recorded, and and that's a pain. So having it all in one yeah. place is super. All right, cool, man. This is great. Um, so what we need now is a live Q&A because there's all the questions that other people are thinking about that, uh, that that I don't I'm not thinking about of what to ask. But is there anything else? Well, I'm going to scan through these pictures you sent me, see if there's anything else that jumps out at me. Anything else you want to throw out there that uh, we haven't hit on that people have been missing? I mean, you know, there there's a lot of other kind of like um, under the hood things, too, that we've added. So, um, you know, the, the GH5 has added uh, five gigahertz Wi-Fi and now it has Bluetooth uh, 4.2. Okay. So what that's going to allow you to do now is, you know, the the five gigahertz band for Wi-Fi, which a lot of a lot of modern phones are now supporting the use of, of you know, Wi-Fi in five gigahertz. Sure. Um, it's a less congested uh, um, space, so your connections are going to be a lot stronger, and your transfer is going to be a lot faster. Okay. Um, the Bluetooth connection is going to allow you to always be synced up to your Apple or Android device. And just always be ready to transfer your information and your files back and forth because it's going to be able to hot swap right into Wi-Fi and transfer over. So this will this will allow you to make that – to keep like an idle connection in the background or something? Correct. Or, yeah. Okay. Even with yeah. – because Apple's so restrictive on iOS. I know it's one of your favorite things to harp on iOS about. Uh, uh, 
but what does that mean? You you have the app, you still have to have the app running or the phone can sleep or what does that mean you can do? So in the, I, I honestly, the, the only area I can speak for is the Android space. Um, yeah. Knowing that, that Android tends to be a little more open, pl- uh, open platform for mm-hmm. stuff like this means that I can always keep my device connected. It'll always stay in idle connection, just like a set of headphones or something like that. Okay. And then when I trigger and I open the app up to say, hey, I want to transfer an image, it'll automate it, it'll automatically make the bridge onto Wi-Fi. Okay. That's to then transfer the heavier load of, of an image. Okay. As you were talking Apple, about that, I was thinking that I know you know, I'm talking about the closed more closed OS on there on iOS, but I know that things like Tile, which is the little um little mm-hmm. tracker device you attach to your keys, that does retain a Bluetooth LE yeah. low energy connection in the background constantly because I don't yeah. have to launch that app and yet the app still knows where I left my keys. So yeah. And, and I, I would imagine it's going to be the same way. Um, honestly, I haven't seen the app yet. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a GH5, but I don't have the updated apps. Okay. So I, I can't test it on my 6S yeah. or my, okay. my one plus. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how it operates because we've been told that it's going to be one of the most streamlined implementations of B of, uh, BLE 4.2. Okay. Um, and knowing how our engineers think when it comes to things like this, I think it's going to be. That would be great. To be honest. Um, but, you know, time's going to tell. Um, I think once I once saw, we get it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I saw a reference to using your phone for the GPS um, coordinates on a much more happier way along with this Bluetooth LED. Oh, yes. So, right. Okay. So, yeah. good. So, tell me about this. Yeah, so before in the current iteration of our app and our Wi-Fi connection is basically you have to connect your phone to the camera, sync everything ready to start with and say, I want to start logging GPS. So now what that does is you have to leave the app open. It logs your your tracking information through GPS in the app. And then when you transfer the images uh, or when you reconnect, you have to then tell it to sync all of the transfer information based on time code from your phone to your camera. And that, you know, depending on if you took five images or you took 5,000 images, it could take anywhere from a couple seconds to an hour or two. Yeah, it was, it was not um, good. It wasn't the greatest implementation, but for not having GPS built into the camera, I think it was a pretty relatively simple way to do it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> With with the um, Bluetooth connection now, it's always going to be able to log that information in real time to the image because that's a small bit of information that's being transferred to and from. So my guess is that's kind of how it's going to skirt that area, at least in iOS, where it stays open and it's active for a reason. Yeah. So it's not just an idle connection where I know. <laughs> so great. Yeah, Apple tends to have that that cautionary setup of, well, yeah. you know, don't, don't really let a connection be idle. Make sure it has a reason behind it. Um, I'm, I'm on a plane to Mexico in about four hours. Can you get one of these to me in time? I really want to take this with me. <laughs> you want to fly me to Mexico? I'm about 20 minutes from Newark airport. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good to me. Oh man, that is, that is really great. Now that, that is one of those little things that is frustrating me to know when that more camera manufacturers haven't just built a damn GPS receiver into the camera. It, yeah. They don't take that much. And the fact that I can have it in my phone all day long tells me it can't possibly be taking that much power. It can't be that well, big. <sighs> it, see, that's kind of also a little bit of the, the other thing too. So in a cell phone, it's slightly different too because you've got cell towers and that's also kind of how it's it's grabbing some of its GPS info. In a camera, because you're going in and out of, of locations, things like that, they actually do become kind of a power draw when you're looking at everything else the camera's doing. Um, if you look at some of the point and shoots in general from almost any manufacturer, you'll see that any camera that's got GPS built into it as a point and shoot, mm-hmm. they're power hogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's because of the system they have to build into it. They're not as advanced as a cell phone is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. I, I, other than that, I mean, with the, the GH5, one other thing that I wanted to definitely mention is we're talking about these kinds of little features yeah. that maybe not everyone noticed is – and bear with me. Some people may think this is like crazy that we're excited about this. Is that 
I can carbon copy all of my camera settings to an SD card and load them to another camera. <laughs> okay, this now this is not just some random feature. That this is one of those that I know I personally have been begging for for years. So yes, I know if, you have. If you're in a just for anybody who's missing the point of this, if you're in a multi-camera shoot, you're in a studio, you're setting up a multi-camera shoot in a controlled environment, you want every camera to have the exact same settings. You no longer have to go from camera to camera with three people going, okay, you know, Bob, John, everybody, look at your camera. Okay, page one, go through the settings. Page two, go through the settings. Oh, wait, I missed this one. Let me change that. No more. Load the settings onto oh, an yes. SD card and or SD card or over Bluetooth, you said. Well, so you can do it over the app and you can do it over SD card. The added benefit of doing it over the app is that you can also sync time code over the app. Right. Oh. If you do it in, oh. in the card, you're syncing all your camera settings. And I have to double check. I think you might be able to sync time code over the app too or over the card too. That'd be a neat I trick. think. I, I got to double check that I one. Do that. I don't think so. But not. no. Ignore but me. The settings. The <laughs> settings. That's, oh my God. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. It, 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 just like I said, I mean, you know, with, with, with our engineers – I think enough can't be said for what um, appeared to be over the last couple of years. Maybe Lumix not necessarily maybe responding as often as, as some users would want us to um, or commenting back as much as maybe some would want us to mm -hmm. about features that they want to see added into the cameras. Yeah. Um, something that I want to make very clear to a lot of people, and, and, and I've said this on a couple of the other interviews that I've done, is that we do listen. We are monitoring and, and, and we see when when shooters, whether they're Lumix shooters or not, we see when people comment about features that they're missing in a mirrorless camera. Mm -hmm. And our engineers take that to heart. A lot of the people that work for our organization that most people may not realize, a lot of them come from the photo industry. You know, um, some of the old, you know, diehard companies that, you know, ran ran the, the, the photo industry for decades a lot of them work for this company. I mean, my, myself, I, I, I worked in the photo industry for a number of years before coming into Panasonic. My boss, Darren, and, and a number of the other guys, you know, they worked for, you know, some of the top tier companies for, for decades prior. There's a lot of people at Panasonic that, that want to see the Lumix brand and see our cameras grow based on what consumer feedback is. And the more feedback we hear and see and the more people that pick these cameras up, give them a shot and actually really try to create something with them, it only allows us to then turn around and be able to create a better product for, yeah. for the end user. You know, yeah. one of Panasonic's slogans, I think the current slogan right now is a better life, a better world. Um, we carry that in across everything. Sure. Um, the better we can make the product, the better we can make the lives of a photographer because the camera just becomes a tool at that point. It doesn't become a hindrance to creativity. Nice. Nice. You can tell them in marketing, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's it's great. That's a very nice bit. And I'm going to I'm going to take what you just said and use that as an opportunity to offer to the people watching this video right now. There are undoubtedly questions that neither of us points that neither of us thought of to talk about, questions I didn't think to ask that you're going, but you didn't ask about this. So <laughs> I've got this guy's phone number. So let's do this, guys. Um, post questions that you want to see answered in the comments. Let me accumulate a bunch of really good questions. And then when I get back from Mexico, I'm going to talk this guy into coming back on here for part two of this interview of, the, of this discussion. So we can talk about all the other, other things that we didn't get to today. The basic specs you can look up. We don't need to go into the basic specs. That's all over the internet. If you have a question about what frame rate does it, just look it up. But if you want to know something that you can't find, you want to know something that's more a workflow issue or a, a theoretical issue. What were you thinking when you did this? Or why is it doing this way? Or what's the purpose behind this? Or it seems like I'm missing the point of this. That's what we want to hear about. And that's what we'll talk about next time I get them on. Sound good to you, Sean? Yeah. I am I am always open to to discuss this stuff. I mean, I, 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 I love working for Panasonic. I yeah. love working for the Lumix group. That's great. Um, I think that comes across in a number of my interviews, as yeah. some people said online. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and and it's it's because of conversations like these. It's because of people like you, Joseph, and 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 the community in the, in the photo industry that you know really makes me excited to to sit here and have conversations like this and and interact and talk with the community because 
the feedback I get from you and and your viewers is what I can take back to to our engineers, absolutely, and really talk to them and, and explain what's going on, um, and hopefully derive a better, newer product or derive an update that can come down the line for th some of these things. Awesome, sounds fantastic, super. Well then, with that, we're going to end this one and put off the rest of it until part two. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sean, for coming. I've got to go finish packing. I'm on a plane in a couple of hours and I have not packed my gear or my clothes yet. So got to go, got to go take care of that. I'll be yeah. packing, up, packing up three Lumix cameras in my bag here. So uh, one of them will not be a GH5, unfortunately, next time. Not yet. All right. All right. Thanks again, my friend. Really good to see you. Really good to be able to do this. And um, am I going to see you in Florida in, uh, in a month? Yes, you will. Uh, maybe we'll do this part two. I'm probably pretty busy there. Ah, this worked out perfectly well. We should just do it like this. We, we might be able to do maybe a special edition or maybe, something from maybe. down there. Who that knows? Could fun. That could be fun. I'll bring okay. some microphones. I'll bring some mic. I'll bring a couple of labs and we can hook it up to the to the XLR adapter. We can record on the GH5 and I can get actual two. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Guys. Take care of yourself. Thank you again very much. Viewers, thank you all for watching. I know this is a long interview, but hopefully a long discussion, long conversation. Got to get the right branding word in there. Uh, see, I'm not in marketing anymore. And, uh, That's all good. <laughs> and uh, we will continue this next time. Thanks again for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.